Bienvenidos, señores y señores, to another episode of the Bleed Lows Podcast. This episode of the Bleed Lows Podcast is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online remains your number one source for all your college basketball betting this season. Get analysis of every play, prop, or point at Bet Online. You'll find the latest odd bracket contests, team matchups, and game trends at Bet Online. There's updated odds for everything from live games, the conference championships, right through the Final Four and the championship game. Bet Online is your college basketball headquarters this season. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to sign up and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Be sure to use our promo uh, code BELIEVE, B L E A V, to receive your bonus. BetOnline.ag, where the game starts. And joining us, Ana Carne Asada, is our special guest. Uh, some of you may know him as Carlos Morales. Others may know him by his, uh, what, what, what would we call it, an alter ego? Desert Doyer. I mean, the man is famous. He was just in the LA Times this past weekend. I saw you on the NBC website. Uh, should we call you Carlos or should we refer to you as the Desert? Uh, uh, when, when I'm in gear, I like to be called Desert Doyer. Desert Doyer. All right. So I, I want to start this way, Desert Doyer. How did this whole personality come about? Uh, you know what? I, I moved out here to Arizona about 22 years ago. And um, I always went to the D-backs games when the Dodgers were in town. And one day, I don't know where, you know, this guy just like, oh, you guys were never here, uh, you, know, you know, talking all this stuff. And I was like, you know what? I need, to, I need to like stand out. I need to find out a way so people know that I'm here all the time. So I, I saw the mask and I was like, that's it. I'm going to, I'm going to wear a mask. And, and then it just took off, you know, the following year, I got the sombrero the following year, I got the poncho. I started adding the patches on there. And like you said, the rest is history. I mean, it's, so is that a blue demon mask or yeah. is it's a blue, the blue demon, the blue demon. So, you know, there's a lot of different Dodger personalities out there. There's you, there's the Desert Dodger, there's El Mariachi Loco. There's a lot of recognizable Dodger fans that have built a following on social media. How did, I mean, when did you come to realization that you are a super fan, so to speak? Uh, you, you know what? I, I, I still don't consider myself a super fan. I mean, I, I don't know. I just, I started social media a while back ago and i just wanted to post you know that hey i'm i'm here dodger fans are always seen in a bad light you know they're always seen like oh fights and they're cholos and they're bad people and like no you know what i, I want to uh show that dodger fans aren't that way they're not we're not all that way you know so i started like i said i started posting and and then little by little just started taking off and uh now i'm like 10,000 followers on, on IG, almost 10,000 on TikTok. And I'm like, man, you know what? This this is pretty pretty awesome. Hey, hey Roger, when did you become uh, aware of Desert Doyer? When was your first experience with him? I probably started seeing the stuff a couple years ago. I mean, because he'd start, I mean, he'd, he'd post his stuff, right? Like, you, you, but you'll do skits too, right? And like, it just, I like, be like watching him, be just like laughing out loud. And I'd like, I show my wife like look at this guy this guy's like he's crazy man he's funny like and that's kind of like you know you just seeing those skits like it's it's a different it's like a different take on like just like a dodger fan right like you know it, it's not just yeah he talks about dodgers and you know he talks about what, what's going on but he keeps it really light keeps it really funny and i think it's 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 a great account you know to follow just for you know any dodger fan right and but also like i said just in general it, it's a good account just uh for social media oh, thanks, you man. know you, you know what? The first time I noticed you, Desert Doyer, was I love your video sequences, your series, so to speak, when you go to spring training. Being that you're in Arizona, you're there at Camelback Ranch. I, I love those vignettes. Uh, your editing skills are very impressive. Do you have a background in, in production? Because those don't just look like half ass videos, dude. Oh. I, I admire your production value. Man, you know, my, my uh, editing team, no, just kidding. It's it's just my <laughs> it's the iPhone that that I do it all on my iPhone. I, I I was for a while I was gonna do it on my on my Mac, but it's just too complicated to be transferring stuff, editing it on there, and then transferring back or whatever it was. And I was like, you know what? I, just the iPhone 
just do the IFE movie, and that's that's where I edit everything from. So you're all self-taught then? Yeah, pretty much. But I, I remember there was one shot that you did. I think it was when you, you were going from Arizona to the Dodger Stadium, and you did it on your bike, and you had what looked like this aerial shot. Did you do oh. that on a drone? Yes, yes. My, my brother owns a drone, and I was like, man, you know what? I, I said, hey, we got to do a shot out in uh, – uh, in LA, you know, we're, we're showing me, and he's like, "Yeah, yeah, I got you, I got you." And uh, he did it because he he's a photographer, a professional photographer, and uh, so he did the drone shot and everything. He sent it to me on my phone. I edited it there and I added it, and that one came out pretty great. Yeah, I mean, that, that, I, that's why I, that I think was one of the first videos that caught my attention because I was just like the the, the post production value there. I mean, the production value it was it was fantastic. Now you're originally from LA, right? Yes, Hollywood. I was originally from Hollywood. Uh, then, uh, moved, like I said, moved out here to Arizona 20 years ago. So what made you a Dodger fan? Oh, man, you know, I, I've always been a Dodger fan. I've loved baseball. Uh, but growing up, I, I you know, I watched a, a lot of TBS, a lot of uh, WGN, because the Dodgers back then weren't on TV as often. Nope. So I was actually, I wasn't a hardcore, let's say, Braves fan, but the Braves were on all the time. So as soon mm -hmm. as I get home from school, TBS, 4 o'clock, Braves game were on. Dale Murphy was my guy. He was my first uh, favorite player. You know, when I when my first Little League team were the Braves. So, and I, I got lucky. I got number three. I was like, oh, man, this is this is a dream. And uh, the Dodgers, I mean, I followed the Dodgers and everything. But they, like I said, they just weren't on TV back then. You know, they were very rarely on TV. They were on ZTV. You had to pay, you know, pay your pay-per-view. <laughs> so, when I, but when I first went to my first Dodger game, it, that changed everything for me. I mean, I saw, I walked in there. It was like walking into a cartoon. Those colors were like amazing. It was a night game. We got there late. So, the, you know, the game already had started, but walking <laughs> in there was like, oh my God, this is, this is incredible. I, I'm a Dodger fan now. So do who, did you have a favorite Dodger when you were younger? Uh, Kenny Landry. Kenny Landry was my, my, my favorite. Uh, he wore my favorite number, number 44. Uh, and it just seemed that every time he would come up, he would hit a clutch home run and uh, he became my favorite. All right, so you, let's get some hot takes in there because you were there on opening day. That's where they got that great picture of you in the LA Times. So uh, I, I'm following you on Twitter, and I know you got a lot of opinions on the lights. So there's a couple of things I want to get your takeaways from, but let's first start with the team. Going into it prior to opening day, what were your thoughts on the Dodgers? <sighs> It's it's gonna be a competitive team. I mean, my only my only concern was the pitching, the starting pitching. Uh -huh. I don't think we have uh, the starting pitching uh, depth that, that 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 we need to carry us in the postseason. We we have an okay lineup right now to get us through the regular season, but we just I think we need one more arm, a, a good arm, to get us, you know, where we need to get. Uh, the, the lineup, I was fine with it. I, I mean, we had some subtractions, but I think what replaced them. It is, is, is equal or even better than what we had. So I'm okay. Um, the lights, uh, I think, took everyone by surprise. And I know you were reporting that the Diamondbacks were complaining about the, the lights. What were your views on the lights experience as a fan? Was it, was oh, it enjoyable? I, I love the lights. Uh, the, the, I, I've been to Atlanta, and uh, they, do, they do that uh, all the time. They, when the, they hit a home run. They turn them off, and then there's uh, when they do the seventh inning, uh, the seventh, uh, the taking out to the ball. They turn them off, and everybody's flashing their their lights, and then they start their little tomahawk chat. And I, I like, man, this is pretty cool. And to see it at Dodger Stadium, I was like, oh man, this is awesome. Uh, so I, I love it. I'm, I'm all for it. Uh, do you? What about the the pitch clock? A lot has been said about now that these games are going too fast. Did they? Did it feel too fast for you on opening day? You know, yeah, when the when the rule came out, at first I was like, you know what, this is this is ridiculous. You know, the, why are we changing it? But going to a few spring training games and uh, and, and and opening day, I don't I don't mind. It. It's not like if I'm paying attention to the pitch clock anymore. It's not like if I'm watching it, like the countdown, like basketball. Oh, we got three, two. You know, like I feel it's we we're gonna have to adapt to it. We're gonna have to get used to it, and I don't mind it. So. 
there's a, there's a couple of things that I want to reach out to you because you had mentioned first that you created the, the, the persona of the Desert Doyer because you wanted to give the Dodger fans uh, a, a, a good look, right? There was a poll that recently came out that said that the Dodger fans are the second worst fan base. <laughs> yes. being, being that you live in Arizona, you're not you know in L.A. along that time, you're able to give us a good outside perspective about how Dodger fans are viewed. And it, it sounds like, uh, compared to other people, we are viewed as a bunch of cholos. Is that accurate? That's very accurate. I mean, uh, people, they hate us. They, 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 that's, that's it. They, they hate us because we're, we're right now in a stretch where, where we're at the top. You know, we're at the top and, 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 you know, reports here, you know, we're on TV all the time. Dodger games are on TV all the time. The Dodgers here, the Dodgers that, Dodgers this. So, People here in Arizona, they hate us for that. They hate us because of jumping in the pool. And that was like, what, five years ago? And, and they still bring that up, that we jumped in their pool. So I, I saw you from far away at the WBC at the Mexico-Colombia game. Uh, did you end up going to the Mexico-United uh, States game? Yes, yes, I was there. Okay, so you're going to be able to vouch for me because I was telling these guys when I came back, Arizona was not ready for the crowds at the WBC. No. I mean, no. people were complaining about the lines for concessions. They completely wiped out all the Mexico merchandise in the stores. In that second game, uh, Great Britain against uh, uh, the United States, they had run out of beer and they were blaming all the Mexicans. <laughs> what were your, were your thoughts with the WBC, that whole experience and is there hopefully any way that they're going to be prepared for the next one? I, I don't think Phoenix will get a, a, a second second one, but I hope they do. But yeah, they they, they were just they, like I was telling everybody that I, that I that I was sitting with, you know, that they weren't prepared. They're they're not used to it. This, you know, they they draw what 17, 15,000 fans on their stadium when Dodgers come over. They're, they're they you know up to thirty, but yeah, they weren't prepared. Lines were long uh, for everything. Restroom. Even I've never seen a man's restroom line. Never. I've seen women. There's always a line for the women's restroom. Never for the man. But there was a line for the men's restroom too. So yeah, it was just they, they weren't prepared for it. They weren't not prepared. All right. So uh, we want to be respectful of your time, Desert Doyer. Uh, Roger, do you have any parting uh, words for uh, Desert Doyer? I, d I just want to get one of his let's go before he takes off, you know, because that's like his, that's like his, uh, one of his All right, trademarks. before we give you the let's go, let, I, I do have a, a couple more party. And, you know, everyone that comes on the show, we do have our, our, the way we end all our shows. And we want to know what is your favorite taco desert doyer. And since you're in Arizona, I want you to give me two locations. Give me one location here in LA and give me one in Arizona. Okay, the one in LA I always go to. Uh, you'll see it on my videos all the time. Every time I go to LA, I, I, I make a point of stopping in Pomona for Tijuana's tacos. Okay. I, I love those tacos from there. Uh, here in Arizona, <laughs> I can't find, I can't, I mean, I can't recommend the place, but I do go to this place called um, uh, Tacos, uh, Baja Tacos. Okay. And, and they're decent, they're not great. They're not great, but they're okay. So how does that happen? How is it that Arizona does not have good tacos? <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea why they don't have good tacos. I, I, especially with the area that I live, people love tacos, and there's like there's only one shop, and they close at 8 p.m. Wow. Like, they don't stay open late. They don't stay open late. So it's like, I, I, I don't know. I got to maybe open a shop here. All right, so, so before we end the show, uh, go go ahead, Roger. Are you still doing the? Uh, I, I remember you do some Star Wars skits. Are you still doing those on your IG or no? Uh, not on the, my current one. I have I, I created another one because uh, okay. yeah, people don't like him. Uh, Dodger fans don't like him. So I just like you know what? I'm gonna stop totally doing totally that, and I created a, a whole new account on TikTok mm -hmm. Trooper with attitude. Uh, oh. Follow it there too. So is that one of the drawbacks of becoming social media famous? Now you've become mercy to the different audiences. It's like, hey man, I followed you for Dodger stuff. Yes. Give me Dodger stuff. Yes, like like right now, I'm trying. I'm trying to like you know not ex well expand. Yes, I'm I'm, I'm follow. I started following 
I, before I just follow Dodger fans. Now I'm starting to follow teams, fans from other teams, and I try to post stuff from other teams. And people are like, hey, I, that's not Dodger related. Like, oh, okay. You know, so <laughs> I try to come back on him, you know, so we'll see how it goes. All right, so I want to give you the last word. What message do you have for Dodger fans, not only in terms of representing Dodger fans, but for the season? Hey, yeah, uh, it's always it's always stay true to the blue. It's hasta la muerte. You know, uh, we're gonna have ups, we're gonna have downs, but hey, let's just represent the right way, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll get another championship ring soon. We're gonna get another one soon. All right, let, let's let's hear it. Let's let's end it with the your, the the catchphrase that belongs to Desert Doyer. When you hear it, you know it's coming from Desert Doyer. Let's go! Let's go! There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. We want to thank Desert Doyer for coming on the show. Hopefully, this will be the beginning of us profiling Dodger fans. I know you. Where can they follow you on the social media, Desert, Desert Doyer? At Desert Doyer on Twitter, IG, TikTok. All the same, Desert Doyer. And there you have it, man. You, when you got when we play the Diamondbacks next weekend, look for Desert Doyer. He'll be there representing for the Dodger yeah. fans once again. Seven, waving that flag, baby. Let's go. There you go. Once again, a big thank you to Desert Doyer for joining us. Hey, thank you guys. And once again, a big thank you to Desert Doyer for joining us. Uh, I, I think, I, I don't know if you've noticed this, Babyface, but there seems to be like a certain number of Dodger fans, super fans or whatever you want to call, that have a, a big following on social media. Like there are certain Dodger fans that are recognized. Have you noticed that? Yeah, yeah, I've noticed that. Um, you know, there's some... There's some people like like Desert Doyer that I mean, like you, I mean, he's been around for a while. Like like you know, we we're talking with him. I mean, he's he's one of those first guys that I saw. You know, and then you know, you see more people pop up trying to come up maybe with with like a gimmick, right? Like what 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 can I do? What can I do? But I think uh, I think you know, I don't know, like his gimmick or his alter ego, as we we're saying. I think that it, it fits him pretty well. You know, it kind of fits you know uh, the LA, I guess lifestyle culture or whatever dodge like dodger fan i think it, it works you know and, and like i said he's a good follow like you know he, he he'll do his dodger stuff his updates but a lot of stuff he's he's pretty he's a funny dude like you know he'll 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 interact with people and he you know i'll be watching those and i'll be like i'll be like this guy's really funny like you know he's, he's a good follow yeah i mean there's uh baseball uh, i think he's called what baseball head baseball head yeah he does and then the, what, what what's the name head. of the guy who has the blue mohawk uh, blue hawk and then there's the guy with the blue beard i think that just blue beard yeah hey, blue right. beard and then <laughs> mariachi so there are a bunch of dodger fans that you know are are recognized and they may have gimmicks like like babyface said so maybe i don't know maybe this is the beginning of maybe we'll do a series where you know we we introduce and get to know them, interact with some of those uh, Dodger fans, because after all, you know, this is a Dodger centric podcast. And uh, as the season has just started, it may have a lot of ups and downs. Uh, I don't know how many people expected that in the opening series, this four game series against the Diamondbacks, that the Dodgers would split. They were two and two. So, Let's get right into it, Babyface. What are your biggest takeaways from this opening series where the Dodgers split with the Diamondbacks? I mean, I think pretty much it's the obvious, right? Like uh, when they score, right, they score big and they win. When they don't score, they don't score at all. You know, one run, you know, they don't win, right? As we saw, their two losses were one-run games each. They scored one run. Their two wins, you know, they scored eight and ten runs, so... When they get that offense going, it looks like, okay, yeah, they're going to put up a, a big number. But then kind of the same thing we've seen, you know, year after year, you know, they'll, they'll run into, you know, where they struggle just to get men on and to push guys over and to score. And I think that's what we saw in these two losses. Uh, yeah, I, it is interesting to me that the, the two wins uh, that they have this year in this series ha looked very, very similar. And the two losses that they have – looked very very similar friday night they were 0 for 7 with runners in scoring position they ended up scoring one run in that game they left 12 runners on base 
And that is something that I think from the history of the Dodgers has always followed them, is the dreaded left on base stat. Today, on uh, Sunday's game, excuse me, uh, they scored one run and they went 0 for 6 with runners in scoring position and they left eight uh, runners on. Um, so that seems to be the trend. I, I want to start with the positive. Let's be positive before everybody, you know, starts losing it because they split with the Diamondbacks. For me, the pitching, the starting pitching, I think was great in all four games. I mean, Dustin May pitched a, a hell of a game on Friday. Unfortunately, he didn't have anything to show for it. And Noah Syndergaard, he, I think, pitched. I, I, I don't think he looked as good as Dustin May on Friday. But, I mean, he started off great. I mean, he had five strikeouts, I think, within the first three innings uh, of that game. And what was very interesting was, so I was at the game on Sunday and they, had, we asked David Roberts when we, uh, Dave Roberts when we were in the uh, press pool with the beat writers. <clears throat> you know, it seemed that Noah Syndergaard, when he first went into spring training, was talking a lot about velocity. And then, as spring training went th- went on, he stopped talking about velo- velocity. And it just seemed like it was like, hey, pitch. You know, you, you, it's not just about striking people out, pitch. So that's why I was a little surprised to see the number of strikeouts in this game. But he was pitching to contact, he was getting people out, and he was very efficient going into that seventh inning. He, I think, had only thrown about 75 pitches. So I was surprised that he brought him out for that seventh inning, but he did. Excuse me. For the first four starts, though, all the starters went six innings. So I think the starting pitching was great. Um, I think for most part, the bullpen, Andre Jackson looked great on Saturday, gave them three innings where he was able to save the rest of the bullpen. Uh, Vessia made one mistake and he paid for it on Friday. Brewstar did not look good today. Uh, and you know, I talked to Will Smith. Will Smith has some theories as to one, but right now we're just, we're focusing on the positive. So for me, the biggest positive was the starting pitching. Obviously, those two games where they scored a lot of runs, the offense looked great. Now, to me, the the concern, and we talked about this on our preview show, for me, the offense <coughs> was a concern. Babyface, what were the positives for you? Well, yeah, I mean, I think the the Syndergaard start, um, that's definitely a positive because we, you know, this is kind of, you don't know what we're going to get, right, with Syndergaard, right? It's kind of... He's coming over to the Dodgers. You know, he's hoping, you know, this is going to be a, you know, a, a new season for him where, you know, he's maybe he's a different pitcher, right? And, and, and you know, he lets the Dodgers do their their magic, right? Like you said, whatever Dodgers touch, you know, turns to go. So that's kind of what we're expecting to see. You know, he had a rough start, last spring start. Um, but, he re, you know, he bounced back, you know, and he had a first good, good impression, you know, first start with the Dodgers. So that's good to see. You know, hopefully he carries that over going, you know, can, you know, to his next start. So that was definitely a positive. Um, as far as the, on the offensive side, right. You know, James Alman in his first game first, you know, he hits that home run, you know, he had a good game there. So that's positive there. Um, Miguel Vargas. Um, I don't know if it had to do anything with, with spring, right. When he was just tracking pitches and he wasn't yeah. allowed to swing, but it seems like his eye has become really great as far as, you know, tracking pitches because he has like seven walks now. Like last year in the time he was up, I think he only had like two or three walks the entire, you know, that entire time. He already has like seven. So that's, you know, you know, if he's going to be now looking for a walk. That's, that's, you know, that's the positive there. And, and obviously Trace Thompson, you know, with the three home runs that he had, you know, that's a positive after his spring. That was, you know, we mentioned this he hit 086 in the spring, right? Like, how much do you take away from from the spring numbers, right? And he yeah. comes out in his first game, right, and he hits three home runs, eight RBIs. So hopefully he continues to. I mean, not asking him to you know hit three home runs every game, right? But be able to come out there, you know, when he's playing and you know be productive, you know, and 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 give him some some value with the bat. Yeah. Um, what are your concerns from that opening series? So. Uh, Obviously, the the bruised are outing today. You know, maybe it was just you know a one off. You know, you know that was kind of what we heard from Doc too. That it just didn't, you know, it didn't seem like his game, right? So 
Okay, so you just chalk that up to you know, next time you you know you should be better, right? So, so that's a little bit concerning there. Um, and yeah, obviously some of the hitting, right? Some of the the hitting woes that we've seen, right? Chris Taylor continue continued to not look great at the plate, right? Max Muncy, I think, also has one hit, but he's hit the ball hard, right? So I guess you take that as a positive as well. He doesn't, but he doesn't have anything to show for it. Um, you know, kind of just those slow starts. You know, Mookie's like three for twelve, right? And you know, that's one of the things we're we're saying with Mookie. Like, um, he has a home run, but we want to kind of see him hit maybe up in the, you know, I take two eighty five, you know, two ninety range. So we got to get him to start getting, you know, on base. Um, and one thing I saw the D backs were doing was uh, the stolen base. Dodgers yeah. what tried maybe once or twice, and I think they got caught. So they're not taking advantage. I don't know how much of a difference the bigger bases are 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 going to help them, but that's something I'd like to see them take more advantage of as well. You know, uh, I want to give credit to the Diamondbacks because, uh, as I said, I was at the Sunday game, and they they weren't doing anything on with Syndergaard. Like Syndergaard was just looking really good against them, and the way they manufactured their runs was by the stolen base. Uh, Carroll stole two bases uh, on them. And, you know, Will Smith after the game told us that, you know, they were conceding the third base bag. Okay, that being said. But it, it what the Diamondbacks did was when you can't score runs, they found a way to manufacture those. The, the bunt in that ninth inning by McCarthy with two outs I thought was kind of ballsy. But he he put pressure on Bruzdar and Bruzdar didn't end up making the play, and it, it resulted in the difference in the game. I don't see the Dodgers doing that. Now, mind you, yes, it's the first <clears throat> series of the season. I hope they will eventually evolve. But to me, it's just very disturbing because I feel it's like the same thing that we saw last year. The Dodgers are very set in their ways. This is who we are. We're going to stick to the script. The script is going to tell us we have success doing it this way. And I think that works for the regular season. But in the playoffs, as we saw with the show pods, when the script isn't working and you're running out of time, I, I think you have to change that. Uh, so I, I have to get my hats off to the Diamondbacks. They, they beat them on Sunday be doing baseball things. And what was interesting was before the game on Sunday, when we talked to Dave Roberts, Dave Roberts talked about the fact he was concerned about the Diamondbacks running game. He was concerned that Syndergaard wasn't going to be able to hold runners on. Syndergaard was doing a, a slide step. And look, Will Smith said they weren't running on them. They didn't have their way with them. It, it looked like any time the Diamondbacks got on base, if they wanted to steal a bag, they could. They were the two occasions Will Smith lost grip of the ball, th throwing to second base. But I don't think he would have gotten those runners anyways. So that to me is something I I wish the Dodgers would do more. But let's be honest: is that is this roster the way it's built? Does it lends itself to stealing bases? Like who on this team do you expect to steal bases? Yeah, and, and that's the thing too with with the new rule. That a pitcher could only throw over twice, right? So it, it kind of does lend itself to like maybe you should steal more, right? Like you, you know, you can probably get a bigger lead, right? You know, you know the pitcher's not going to probably throw over, you know, that often because if he throws over twice, now you can get the biggest lead you want. You can be halfway and he's not going to throw over, right? Because it'll yeah. be a balk if if he tries to throw back. So I mean, as far as you know, the line obviously, I think I think Mookie can steal a bag, right? Yeah. Um, I think James Altman can steal a bag. He stole one on Sunday. Uh, right. Okay. And I think uh, Freddie Freeman, for whatever reason, he seems to steal a couple bases here and He's there. He's an so. underrated base runner. Dude. Yeah. Freddie Freeman is an underrated base runner. You know, obviously Chris Taylor, you know, he'd be somebody you expect. Uh, I mean, even somebody like Trace Thompson, I'd expect to steal. Right. Um, but yeah, those you know, Dodgers don't have the like a true speedster, right? They don't have no Ricky Henderson, you know, on, on the team, right? And you know, I mean, obviously, you don't see those types of players anymore that are just you know thinking of stealing the bag, right? But but yeah, I mean, I think I think it, it, it's set up for them to be a little bit more aggressive on 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 the base path, you know. I think they got to implement that more. 
Yeah, I would like to see that change. I, I would like to see it happen. But again, I just don't know if this roster is built for that. Y you know, what's concerning to me in that series, that first series, it was just feast or famine. You know, even even that Saturday night's game when Trace Thompson hit the three home runs, they scored 10 runs in that game and they only had eight hits. You know, so it's like the home run... You know, if you hit the home run, I don't want to say they were relying on the home run. I would just feel much more comfortable with a baseball team that can learn to manufacture runs. So if the home run is not coming, I mean, they got out hit today. I, I, I mean, on Sunday, excuse me. I mean, Zach Davies, Zach Davies did not look dominant to me. Okay. The guy threw 83 pitches, 44 of them for strikes. But it just seemed like the Dodgers just could not, they just couldn't generate anything on the base pads. They couldn't get runners in. The, the, the leaving runners on base, that was a huge stat. So it is something, look, I get it. It's just the first series. So we're just reacting to the first series in baseball. Uh, everything I think will hopefully even up. So I don't expect the starting pitching to continue to be this great. Nor do I expect the offense to be this inconsistent. I would think it would be more consistent as the the season progresses. Uh, but it just does automatically feel a little different than last year, doesn't it, Babyface? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would have been happy, obviously, right, with at least three wins. I mean, you'll take a split, right, obviously. But, you know, we'll see. I mean, we, we kind of mentioned, you know, the the – the D backs were probably going to be there, you know, they're a little bit underrated, but they you know, a lot of people are saying they kind of, they might be a little bit sneaky good. So, you know, we kind of saw that a little bit with them, you know, kind of who they're, who they're trying to be or how they're, you know, how they're trying to get to, you know, it looks like the running game is probably going to be a big part of their, their game, you know, and now we have the Rockies coming in. So for a quick two game set, right. And they just split with the, with the show pods. Show pods. Yeah. So, you know, we'll see what, what the Rockies bring. Well, and you know what? And that might just be the great equalizer in this game now is is the stolen base. You know, you may not have the offensive power. You may not be great hitters. But if you can get on base, like I said, there is no better example than what Corbin Carroll did where he got on base and then stole two bases and scored a run. And just like that. And, and Syndergaard was pitching good in those first, at least through the first five innings uh, or four innings, the first four innings, he looked really, really good. Um, so you were there at opening day, babyface. I want to segue because I saw a lot of conversation about this on the social media, the lights. What are your thoughts on these new light show that's going on whenever the Dodgers hit a home run and what was going on in between in the middle innings as to why the lights were going out in between innings? So, yeah, so I guess the first uh, look that we got at the lights was kind of um, when there was a home run, right? So yeah, they, they shut them down. They kind of just, it kind of just goes black and there's a few lights, you know, going as, as the runners going across, you know, running the bases. So, from the press box, you don't see it, but I guess when you're outside, right, and, and you're seeing the full stadium, like there was a couple of pictures I saw that look really cool. Like the seats are lit up in all in blue, and the stadium looks kind of dark, right? So mm -hmm. it, lo it looks pretty cool. It looks like it's a, it's it's definitely a different experience, a different, uh, you know, to to do the celebration stuff. But um, I don't know, you know, obviously in first couple games, you know, they're still kind of getting adjusted into like, hey, how do we do this? When, I guess there was some stuff where they were turning down the lights too when the D-backs relievers were coming in or even like warming up. And I guess, you know, D-backs didn't like that, you know, like, because they couldn't see <laughs> kind of where they're going. So there's a bunch of stuff that they're still kind of figuring out, like how are we going to, how are we going to use these lights, you know? Um, but I think it's a, it's a new, you know, it's pretty cool. You know, I mean, I haven't seen that many stadiums do that, right? Desert Doyer mentioned that, that Atlanta does that, but I don't know. I, don't I was know. not aware that Atlanta did that. I, I yeah. thought the Dodgers were the first ones to do it, but Desert Doyer told us that the, the Braves, they do it in yeah. Atlanta. Yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty cool with these lights because, like, you know, they turn off and on, like, you know, like your light switch at home, right? You suddenly turn I mean, before, I don't know if you remember when those lights, if yeah. whatever it is, they went out. There's been a couple of times that they went dark. 
it takes like 20 minutes for them to turn back on. So now it's it's kind of cool that you can turn them off and on and do all these special effects. You know, it, you know, I think it adds to the environment of, you know, being out of the game, you know, especially in, in LA at Dodger stadium, it kind of just adds to all that. Yeah. So I went, I, I went to a day game, so I was not able to, to feel this whole new light experience. Uh, I did see a peop- some people on social media refer to it, that it felt like a club, um, I know you said you were in the press box, so maybe it, it did feel different. Uh, I know the Diamondbacks complained about it, but did you feel it was disruptive at all? I did see someone in social media make a comment that on TV it did not look good. Mm, when I was watching a couple of the games, like on Friday and yesterday, you would see like when there's a home run, you'd see it. You still see it go dark. Like yeah. as the runners playing, like by the time they hit second, it goes dark. So you can kind of see that. Um, I don't think they really show a, a wider shot where it shows the entire stadium, but I mean, it looks fine. It looks fine to me from there. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I think it's, you know, it's just going to take some time to figure out, Hey, when should we use them? When should we not use it? You know, obviously when the pitcher's trying to warm up, I don't think you could have the lights off and stuff like that. So. So were you able to walk around the stadium at all on opening day? Did you? Is there anything else that you heard about Dodger Stadium uh, from the fans itself being back at Dodger Stadium or the, the even this whole series, this whole opening series? Um, I did just walk around. Um, I did see some of the, the new shirts, the Mr. Cartoon shirts that were out, and, and apparently uh, a lot of them were sold out, right? You were saying today, like, the Julio ones are gone. So I, I saw some of those were available still, and then by the time I came out in the in the sections that they had them, they weren't there. So I'm assuming they all sold out in those sections. Um, there might be some left to some players, but for the most part, uh, I think they'll sold out. Yeah, I was there for uh, for Sunday's game, so I went around to I went to the top deck, and then I went around uh, different levels. I went on the reserve level, I went in the loge level, and the field level. To uh, to see if I could find any of those. In particular, I was in search of a Julio Diaz, Mr. Cartoon, uh, jersey, um, and so all the vendors were telling me, eh, "Good luck trying to find one. If you do find one, especially for Urias, if you do end up finding one, buy it because they didn't know." I asked them, "Well, if I go to the top deck, to the top deck store, can I can I get one?" And they said, "That's the first place that sold out, right?" So he had talked to other little vendors on different levels, and they said they didn't have any of the UDS. All I saw was uh, I saw a lot of Freddie Freeman. And I saw some Mookie Betts. The Mookie Betts, it looks like it was all in blue. One vendor told me that the black shirts were the ones that sold out first. The black for all three players, and they only made them for Freeman, Mookie yes, Betts, sir. and Urias. Yeah, I was going to ask you, was it just those three players? Like Those, no, those no are the one only else? three. Those are the only three that they made him for. So uh, if, if you guys can't get your hands, and here's the other thing that I was told, and that is they are on, they only did one printing of these shirts. So they're not going to make more. If they do end up making more, they have to renegotiate that with Mr. Cartoon. So if these things sold out as quickly as they did, or there is a, a demand because they were only selling these at the stadium, you could only get them at Dodger Stadium. You can't buy them online. Uh, you can't buy them at the Dodger Clubhouse stores. In like, for example, the one in Montevideo, um, you had you could only get them at Dodger Stadium. So if they do decide to do another printing of these shirts, you best believe Mr. Cartoon is going to have a real sweet deal where he's going to sit there and say, "Hey, uh, yeah, we can print them again, but I want a bigger percentage uh, of the sales." So. I wonder if that's going to deter the Dodgers from doing another printing. But like I said, from from what the vendors told me, they were almost sold out of the Urias stuff on opening day. They had some left over for Friday night, but by the time I got there on Sunday, they were gone. Now, the black and the blue shirts have different designs. The black shirt has just L.A. on the front, and it's just the letters L.A., the blue one has Dodgers in the front. In terms of a design, Babyface, what did you think about that? Did I did you hear any feedback? Do people really like these? Or is it just because it's something new and it's exclusive? That's the reason why there was such a high demand for them. Yeah, I think 
I mean, that's that's the reason for the high demand, right? The the different because the front the you know the front one on the black shirt it's it's the regular LA logo, right? And then the yeah. and then the blue one's the regular Dodger script. The only thing that's different is is the writing, right? In the back, yeah. Mister Mister Cartoon, he drew the, he drew that by hand. That's all you know. That's all hand hand drawn you know numbering and letters. So you know it's reflecting his artwork, which is pretty cool. Um, so that's why it's gonna you know they're gonna be limited, right? And I think. You know that's that's how you do it, right? You just do a, a limited run and and you let them sell out. Like, I mean, will they maybe do a, a second run or add more players? You know, that'd be kind of cool to see. You know, some different players get in on it. Um, but but yeah, I think I think uh, fans like them, right? Or else uh, they wouldn't be sold out, right? Well, they definitely like the Urias ones. I also was able to see the Mister Cartoon mural. So for those of you who are aware, there are a series of murals in the loge out in right field. And so there's Mookie, there's the famous Julio Urias, Kershaw, all from the World Series. But they just added a new part to that mural and it's Mr. Cartoon. But I don't know if anyone has noticed this, but behind Mr. Cartoon in that mural is the Joe Kelly pouty face. And so I believe that that mural was created by Mr. Baby. Uh, so maybe we can get those, some of those muralists on the show and we, we can talk about them. But uh, that, that uh, was something that I was able to explore making my first trip to Dodger Stadium for the opening series. Uh, the other thing I think that we need to address, uh, and I think a lot of people need to come to terms with this, is the pitch clock, as many people like to complain about it, the pitch clock, there is no doubt you cannot deny the impact of the pitch clock because it is, it seemed, and I don't know this for a fact, but it seemed all four games an hour in, they were already into the fourth or the fifth inning. So I know that for Dodger games, you always got to deal with traffic. So it's really hard to get to the game, especially during the week. And before there was that whole adage, you show up in the third inning and you leave in the seventh. I got news for you guys. You can't do that anymore. So you really need to factor in when you're going into when you're going to a Dodger game this year, you either have to take the day off of work or you have to leave work early because I I you have to be there by the time the game starts because the way these games are going it's I'm telling you 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 get there an hour late, you're already half the game. I mean, Babyface, you were there opening day. Opening day was under three hours, right? Yeah, that game, by the time the fifth inning was starting and it was getting to an hour, an hour into the game, that game went two and a half. It, it took the second part from the fifth to the ninth took an hour and a half. So that that's what slowed down a little bit right there. But, I mean, the games are flying by. Like you said, you know, if, if you're if – you're, you know, say you work till six, right? And you're, and even if you're an hour away or whatever, like, you know, I'm about an hour away. By the time you get there with, you know, trying to get in, you know, and if you, it takes you, you know, if you're not in to almost eight o'clock, like you're almost missing half the game. So it's, yeah. you know, it's going to be tough. You're going to have to figure out, you know what? I'm going to the game. I want to be there at the stadium at least. I mean, not even driving in by seven, like like walking in at least. I mean, you're still going to wait to get in as well too, right? So you want to be in at the stadium at least by like six, six thirty, you know. Yeah. And, Especially, and, want... and on giveaway nights too, and like that that throws a whole. Oh, you know, yeah. when it's giveaway nights too, I mean, you got to factor all that stuff in too as well. And I and I want to give the point to our bleed Los contributor Jason Barquero, who had told us this before the season started that what he was really worried about is if these games are going to be consistently under three hours and we're looking at two and a half, what is that going to do to concession sales? And if this becomes a problem where owners are losing money at concessions because the games aren't long enough, I, I really wonder if they're going to put an end to that pitch clock. But it is amazing to me watching games and seeing them consistently like 215, two and a half hours going, wow, these games used to be over three hours all the time. This is how much time was wasted by not only pitchers, but also by hitters. So 
I, I know people have been complaining already that, oh, the games are too fast. So first it was the games were too slow. Now the games are too fast. Look, the length of these games is perfect for TV. I am very curious for the person who goes to these games in person. Are these games going too fast? And if they are, let us know. Send a, a comment on our social media. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Comment on our YouTube page. I, I mean, are these games, it is just the first opening series, but I am curious to see how this develops because so far, it is consistent. It is. It's a rarity if a game comes close to three hours. Uh, but I, I am very curious to see how this turns out. You know, and I think one of the complaints probably that you might hear is like, you know, you're at the game. You're you're say you're in there, but say you go to the concession stands, right? We know how concession lines are, right? They're yeah. they're pretty long. You're you could be waiting out there 30, 40 minutes in a in a line, right? And, and you're gonna miss an inning or two, right? I mean, that's how quick these things are going right like even the other night that they scored the 10 runs that game was still like what 215 or something like that yeah it was still so under three hours there was still a lot of scoring yeah and it was still really fast so it's like i mean it's like either you get your you know you it's like you're going to be in your seats pretty much unless you know you want to miss you know two innings of the game you know so all that stuff like you know it's going to be interesting to see how that all plays out you know whether are they making less money you know, are people not wanting to leave their seats now once they get there because they don't want to miss any part of the game? You know, so yeah, we'll see what 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 happens. Yeah, I, that's why I I want to give Jason Barquero his point. I I'm very curious to see what these owners do because I mean, Bill Plaschke of the LA Times wrote an article about it saying that the pitch clock is like the greatest invention that's ever happened uh, to major league baseball. But it, I, I just don't think you can deny the fact that it's like, wait a minute, how are they shaving 45 minutes, 30 minutes and almost an hour to these games when really nothing has changed? Everything has been the same. The only thing that has changed is they put the pitch clock on there. Yes, they went ahead and limited the throws, but to me, what they have eliminated, and I just didn't realize how much time, how time consuming it was for the batters to step out of the batter's box, walk around the batter's box, for the pitchers to walk off the mound and walk around, around the mound. I mean, there's just no excuse. Look, if you have a problem that the game is too long and now you have a problem that the game is too fast, you just don't like baseball. Because for me, nothing has really changed. It's it's really more engaging. I I don't have a problem with the pitch clock. Uh, I have not heard. I know there was violations in a couple of games, but I don't think there was anything catastrophic. At least not yet. It's the first weekend of the series, but we'll see. But I I I, I mean I think it's great that you know you're not staying up, you know, until eleven o'clock during the week watching a baseball game yeah i mean so far so good like i said the thing that that you know and i've mentioned before on the pitch clock is let's see what happens when it costs somebody a game right when when it when it's crucial time right then let's see what happens see what the reaction is because you know it's coming right and, and then you know maybe we'll see some type of change where maybe they don't use it in the ninth inning for like a game that's tied or it's like a one-run game or something, right? Just to keep it, or you know, something. I mean, I don't know if, like I said, we'll cross that bridge, I guess, when we get there, you know, but, you know, it'll be interesting to see if it does cost, you know, a team a game, and, and we'll see what the what the uh, cry is then. Yeah, absolutely. So just to recap then, if the Dodgers split their season opener uh, against the D-backs 2-2, two and two. there was a lot of positives that we could take from that series, I think there's things that we just need to keep an eye on. Uh, it seems a little bit of extreme to to have these blowout games and then you have two games where you just scored one run. Like if it was against, you know, that opening day, I did not expect them to score as many runs as they did because last year, um, gosh, who's the Diamondbacks pitcher? that uh, Zach Gallen. Zach Gallen had a really good season you know, for, for the Diamondbacks. And he was pitching really well, and he's pitched well against the Dodgers. So for the Dodgers to be able to get to him, I didn't expect them to get shut down by Kelly Merrill and, and Zach Davies. That, that's one thing I, I was not expecting. So I, I hope this is not uh, things to, to come for this season. But, look, it, I, I keep reminding everybody, 
it's just the opening series. I just, I already saw a tweet already. I'm so sick of this offense. I'm over it already. And it's like, it's game four of the season, guys. It's, it, it's game four. We still have, there's a four way tie for first place at the end of the first weekend between the show pods, the Dodgers, the D backs, and the Rockies. So, uh, it'll be, it's going to be interesting. I'm, I'm curious to see how this, uh, season, uh, the other thing that surprised me is that Hayward, Jason Hayward didn't get a start this whole four game series. I thought he would start at least one game so far. He's the guy that they've been bringing off the bench. Uh, Dave Roberts did say that he started a new three home run rule and that's why Trace Thompson. So maybe Jason Hayward was scheduled to start on Sunday, but because Trace Thompson had the game that he had, yeah. he decided to, to put him out there. But I am very curious how this platoon situation is going to work uh, for the outfield. And then the other thing that uh, Dave Roberts told us on Sunday was Mookie Betts was playing second base because of what happened. Oh, yeah, I want to end the show on this with the Max Muncy thing. Max Muncy did not play on Sunday. The reason why Max Muncy did not play on Sunday, for those of you who saw the play on Saturday, it seemed like he got hit in the nuts uh, on a ground ball. So one of the questions that was asked, not in a in an overt way to Dave Roberts, I don't know if you remember this, babyface, but back when Adrian Beltre used to play for the Dodgers, remember when he got hit in the nuts and he didn't wear a cup? Mm -hmm. So it was kind of asked of Roberts, was Muncy wearing a cup? And so we did not get confirmation that he was or wasn't wearing a cup. But you would think that a third baseman would wear a cup. I don't care how uncomfortable it is to wear a cup. If you're playing third base, don't you have to wear a cup? Didn't we see that with Muncie last season? Remember when they were in Chicago and Wilson Contreras, he kind of hit him, remember? And we're like, oh, I don't think Muncie was wearing a cup, right? Wow. that That, that is yeah. just... That's just too brave, man. There's no way, I, especially third base against major league hitters, there is no way I'm not going you, out there without wearing a cup. What do you think the percentage is of, of, of major league players that actually wear a cup? That's a very good question. I mean, I, 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 I think, we, you know what? I think when we're in the clubhouse, I think we should ask guys that. Are you wearing a cup? Are you wearing a cup? <laughs> you, you don't think that's going to be weird? You don't think people are going to be like, oh, creepers over here. The Bleed Lows podcast is yeah. just a bunch of people. We're, we're, I mean, we're running a poll. Like, do you guys wear a cup or not? A lot. Uh, the beat reporters were all trying. They never said cup. They never. It was like an episode of Seinfeld where they were talking about something, but they didn't actually say what they were talking about. But Dave Roberts got a good laugh about it. Even Dave Roberts was just like, I don't know why these guys don't wear cups, especially if you're playing third base. But. Dave Roberts did say he's not concerned. It's just that Muncie still experienced some soreness. So that's why he wasn't in the lineup on, th on Sunday. So because he wasn't in the lineup on Sunday, that means Chris Taylor has to play third. Miguel Vargas, I think, was going to have a day off anyways that Sunday. So if Taylor's playing third, now who's your second baseman? And this was a conversation that we had. Too bad that Princesa de Picolandia is not here. She's on assignment. But when we had talked about who's going to be, <coughs> excuse me, the backup infielder on this. So Mookie Betts had to play second base today. And luckily he got moved to right field because that Sunday game could have been a lot worse for Bruzdar if Mookie didn't throw out Martell at home. So that's your second baseman throwing somebody out at home from right field, by the way. So how did Mookie look at second in the prior innings? Hey, he turns a, a couple of double plays today that I, I was impressed in. I mean, he, he held his own today. Uh, so, I mean, it's a good, as an emergency, I don't think the Dodgers want him. Look, I know at the beginning of spring training, Dave Roberts said he was going to play 50 games there. Then he backtracked, and now he said uh, maybe 10 games at second base. Look, what has become obvious is if there is an injury, it's going to wreak havoc for the Dodgers because they don't have any backups. Like, who's the backup for second base for Miguel Vargas? I guess Chris Taylor, right? But then Chris Taylor's also the backup at third base for Max Muncy. So it, it seems like Mookie might have to end up playing second base more than we thought this year. Well, they could always put Muncy at second also again and Taylor at third, you know, something like that. 
But when when Muncie was on the show, Muncie said he he likes playing one position and sticking to one position, and I and I feel like when he did that, he he had good seasons. Like when he was primarily playing first base, he had a good season. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I'm just hoping that Muncie, uh, you know, kicks it into gear. You know, coming this uh, next next uh, couple games. Yeah, I, I mean, look, it, I, I think it's way too soon. You got to give these guys at least a month or two uh, before we realize what's going on here. Because if we just reacted based on an opening series, look, Chris Taylor, that last week of spring training, everyone was like, oh, he's, he's looking better. You know, maybe he figured things out. On Sunday, Chris Taylor struck out three times and he was striking out a lot in spring training. And we talked about this on previous episodes. The Dodgers need Muncie and Chris Taylor to go back to have the seasons that they've that they normally have. Because if those guys struggle, the the fact that they scored one run in two games that that might become something more common. So uh, I, I I wanted to interject that story, and and maybe yeah, maybe that is something that we got to start asking players more often is. Why don't you wear a cup? What What is the thing about that? I get outfielders not wearing a cup, but if you're in the infield, man, especially at third base, don't, don't you got to wear a cup? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I remember Little League, right? You'd come around with a cup check, right? I don't think That's they do right. that. I don't think they do that in the big leagues, but maybe, maybe they got it. They do a cup check when you're not even wearing a cup. So it's just, it's, <laughs> it's ridiculous, these kids. Uh, so before we wrap things up, Babyface, any last words? Yeah, I'm, I don't think I don't think we can take much away from this opening series, right? I mean, it's, it's a split. You know, we kind of saw what they can do with the bat, and then we saw what they what they can't do, right? When it kind of we're kind of still at the same, you know, it's gonna take a little bit while longer to uh, to kind of see what team we have here. Yeah, that's it. Don't panic. No pasa nada. No pasa nada. They split. Let's see what happens as the season progresses. So for those of you who have just stumbled across us on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can catch up on past episodes. Uh, you can also subscribe to the audio format. You can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. For the Bleed Lost Podcast, you are sido su servidor, Juan Ramirez, de parte de mi colega, Babyface. Nos vemos para la próxima. This episode of the Bleed Lost Podcast has been brought to you by betonline.ag where the game starts. <laughs>